This is The First Stop, a podcast with the aim of exploring the minds of artists in and around New Haven. Today, we'll navigate the mind of New Haven-based artist, Holly Schindler. The works discussed in this podcast can be found on our blog at firststopart.com and on Polly's website, hollyschindlerpainting.com. Polly is a prolific painter who over the years has toggled between abstraction and realism. She has always been a collector of objects, images, textures, and ideas. In the past couple of years, Polly has become fascinated by furniture, interior design, and imagined domestic spaces decorated with objects she finds both in the real world and on the internet. Her paintings deal with myriad subjects, a few of which are the human yearning for privacy, the push and pull between real and imaginary, as well as the complex history of painting. Welcome to the show, Polly. Thank you. I first met you at Pratt Institute. We were both getting our MFAs. Can, can you describe what your work was like back then? Yeah. Um, yeah, I went into school with, um, well, I applied to school with a, the idea that I was making sort of abstract but architectural work. So a lot of buildings, a lot of big structures, um, a lot of windows. Um, and at that point, um, I was really just about these big objects, and they just ended up being buildings because I didn't know really what else to call them. But they were <clears throat> they were semi abstract, right? Yeah, well, like that's what I got into school with, and then once I was in school, I, they became a lot more abstract. Yeah, I was concentrating a lot more on line and gesture and a lot of drawing into paint. That's what I remember. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of black. A lot of like color. Um, background, mm-hmm. black on top, and then scraping into the black paint to get to the the bottom layer. One of the cool things about getting older as an artist mm-hmm. is to sort of look back yeah. at your whole process and and the work that you were doing in the past, right? And sort of wonder how you got to the place that you are now. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. And I, and when I look at your work, when I think about what you were doing, because I actually remember that work from Pratt, and and I've you know followed you on Instagram and seen what you're up to for years now, right? Um, and you've moved from abstraction. You've gone through and dealt with abstract uh, sort of symbol slash corporate logo looking artwork. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of um, intentionally naive or something like that. And now you're doing these interiors, and I'm really interested in, you know, how how did you get from point A to point B? Can you trace your thought process or evolution and kind of come up with a reason why you're here? <laughs> That's a very good question. And something I, I, I actually don't think I give it enough thought because I'm, I just say, well, it's an evolution, blah, blah, blah. But... Um, I am, I took some drawing classes here and there, you know, undergrad, but I never went to school for painting. I have literally never taken, taken a painting class before. So, and I have, I have a history undergrad. Like I just, I don't have, oh, a wow. fine, yeah, I don't have a fi- uh, fine arts um, background, even though I've been making work since forever, but up to school. And then even once I was in school, um, where obviously I had some sort of a I was afraid of being found out, you know, I'd be, I'd be a fraud because I don't, didn't have the background. But once I got into school, I felt um, confident to be making all sorts of different things. I felt a little, I felt able to branch out a little bit and I really got into the materiality. Um, I mean, you know how exciting mood can be. So I'd go there and get fabrics and, you know, I started working overtime with gold leaf and just going nuts with it. All I really cared about was, was the material. And it's hard in New York to really, well, for me, in a studio with four, sometimes five other artists to, I mean, beyond not having a lot of space, it's hard to keep your own voice. There's just a lot of influence. There's a lot of sharing of materials, a lot of sharing of ideas, a lot of input, which, you you know, you ask for. Sometimes you don't ask for it. Yeah. Um, A lot of people coming in and out of your studio. It's really hard to make work in a vacuum if that's what you want to do. So that was a time of making art as a community. 
mm-hmm. way of speaking. You try to keep your practice your practice, but it can it can be tricky, especially if you're curating together or you are working collaboratively. Mm-hmm. So in when I left New York, it was somewhat or very uh, it was it wasn't something that was planned. So yeah. when I got home, I kind of was able to shut all the the background noise off, mm-hmm. and I had no input. <laughs> I was really just looking at was I think it might have been an a, an information collecting situation just a time of what do I want to do right and thing and no one's looking so why don't I just see what I want to do and I began to paint objects yeah. which <clears throat> I ver- I didn't really do I didn't really know how to do it and so when I got home and even when I was in New York a little bit I was starting to make these patterns um and they started off as nothing just little squiggles or something like that and then they became planets, and then they became flowers, and then they became um, sailboats. It was just about experimenting with a form. And then one day, I decided to put all of the forms into one space together. And I was also making teacups. And there's one painting, and it's gone now. Some guy bought it, which I couldn't believe because it was such a like a, a strange intersection of where mm-hmm. I was and where mm-hmm. I am now. Um, and I don't necessarily think it was a very good painting but it was a table and a chair and a teacup and I think that there might be some sort of a a curtain and that was really where where the next thing took off where I am now because it was really it was a um it was like putting all the pieces together Mm -hmm. uh in this piece that wasn't necessarily very interesting but I was also in that piece working on textures the table does have sort of mm-hmm. a, cause I was really into working flat I mean everything had a dimension but it was all very flat and right. slick and yeah so this was me going into a period of investigating how to create something lifelike because yeah. I never ever was invested in doing that at all it was never my MO so when I started to look around at the textures of things and um, that's when it got sort of interesting and something I wanted to explore also like I said Leaving New York, which is a zoo, I'm in Connecticut. I'm staying at my parents' house. It is quiet. You can hear a pin drop. Uh, If I didn't want to, I didn't have to see a soul all day long. And making work in that environment, you really look around. You have time to just look around you and look at how, you know, the room is set up. The way things look in the light, the way things look, the way we set up a room the way we, you know, choose to hang up art that we like, all the decisions that go into creating a room, a house, a space. And I'm not a decorator. Like, I wouldn't know what to do if someone said, you can you have carte blanche to decorate or design this space. I really don't know what I would do. But when it comes to painting it, um, it's different because Most of the rooms, and a lot of people have told me this, my rooms don't make any sense. I mean, Mm -hmm. nothing's quite... I mean, the room doesn't exist in the world. There's no... Right. It's not based in any sort of reality. Did you read that article that Jason Stopa wrote about painting as total environment? And he's talking about Trudy Benson and virtual reality in painting. It was... He kind of... He writes this article that sort of defines, like, this group of painters like Laura Owens and Kelty Ferris and Rachel Rosin and Trudy Bench- Benson as directly conversing with, you know, virtual reality. Mm-hmm. And I actually am teaching a VR class, and I was reading about your process with your work and how, in a way, you're sort of creating a virtual space in a painting, Mm -hmm. and you're gathering things that exist in the analog world, and obviously you're painting, so that's analog too, but you're placing them into an environment that doesn't exist, and you're sort of mining uh, things and collecting things and collecting textures and kind of turning them into a new um, place. And it reminded me a lot of, you know, for video games and virtual reality, you sort of find textures like there are grass textures and brick wall textures. And they're just photographs of textures that, you know, get placed online and then people gather them and use them as textures for like a made up building or a made up wall or a made up It's like when you used to have to make the house for The Sims. Yeah. We were like, what? What brick do you want to use? Yeah, exactly. What what siding do you want to use for the house? Yeah. So it's like all these things that exist and then putting them together to create something that doesn't exist, but still referencing stuff in the real world. And so I just started, I thought about VR because I'm kind of steeped in that myself. Sure. Is that something that you've thought about at all with your work? 
it really the only time I ever think about my work in in any sort of a concrete way is when people ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's real, is this a real place? And I think no. You know, I start with a piece of furniture that I think is interesting or lately it's been and it's and it's interesting that I look at uh the inside outside situation where if something interesting is happening outside or the color coming through the window, there's just a mm-hmm. nice And sometimes it looks like it's a painting on the wall versus a window. And I like the ambiguity. But it's funny because when I first was painting those buildings, I was always interested in the windows. So I think that might just be a a sort of theme that I've that's sort of been running. Yeah. Inside, outside, um, light, dark. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I was thinking about that a bit because I came across I was doing a talk for a panel at Central and I was looking and I found all of these old paintings of mine and the one thing that runs through everything is these these rectangles of different colors against the same background and it was they're all windows interesting so, yeah yeah it, yeah it i i read some of your past interviews and you were talking about how you you value privacy and sort of like almost like burrowing into your private space which is funny because i like windows, looking in other people's windows you, yeah, the, the voyeuristic <laughs> yeah. quality of, yeah. yeah. Um, can you explain, like, what that's about or where that comes from for you? Like, like why, do you, why do you think that's important to you? Privacy? Privacy, yeah. Um, it's not that I'm, I'm not even necessarily a private person. It's mm-hmm. something to do with security. Mm-hmm. And when, like, I, I, you know me, I'm a very You're honest You're an outgoing person, person yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I think, so like. You're I'm honest, too. Honest yeah. and somewhat. I can be blunt sometimes, mm-hmm. but um, when it comes to your private life, I love the idea of doing whatever you want behind closed doors. Yeah, I just find that very exciting for some reason, yeah. and it's nothing, um, nothing devious or anything mm-hmm. like risque. But and maybe it just goes back to from being a kid where nothing was just yours, but as an adult, you can do whatever the heck you want. But we yeah. still feel like we're under a thumb. Yeah. So from leaving New York and coming here. It's, it feels very, it's... Like you don't have roommates. Right. Like you have to have a roommate in New York. You can yeah. kind of just do whatever the hell you want in your private right. And now I space. can luxuriate in mm-hmm. space. And also, I'm spending more time outside than I ever did before. And even then, in New York, you can't find a private outside yeah. space. You're yeah. never like far farther than 10 feet from anybody ever. Mm-hmm. And here, I can take my dog and we can go to a field and there won't be anyone else there. I'm basically just talking about stuff I'm getting from your work and I'm not trying to tell you like your works, you know, this is what your work is about. But your work sucks. You're, no, I love your work. No, but um, I, so my wife is is writing a dissertation about the Civil War and how it's way more complicated than this, but the gist of it is about how um, the war affects domestic spaces and mm-hmm. kind of finds its way into private spaces mm-hmm. and, you know, how women responded to the war and how objects from the battlefront were brought into the house and how people made stuff and crafted things, you know, differently um, in response to the war. And then also how domestic things make their way out into the war and how soldiers kind of try to bring their home life to mm-hmm. the battlefront, which is a common thing with, you know, people, soldiers and stuff. And I'm, I don't think your work is about war or the Civil War at all, but it because I'm steeped in that, I immediately think about privacy and interior space and then start to think about like the opposite and exterior space. And I started thinking about the sort of myth of like the American West and uh, this idea of privacy and like being by yourself and that kind of American quality of being by yourself, you know? Mm, yeah. And I thought it was interesting because it made it started making me think about, because your work is very, um, in some respects, like there are certain paintings that look totally, you know, made up, like, um, or like invented spaces and Especially that one that's, you know, there's the Morris Lewis Mm -hmm. painting on the wall. And then there's like a James Terrell looking window in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you have the um, Law and Order painting from 2017, which it looks very much like. Autobiographical. Autobiographical, yeah. And something that I relate to having binged on Law and Order before. Right. Um, And it it doesn't look like an invented space and neither does the 
kitchen sink in the more like early morning. Yeah. Kitchen yeah. sink paintings, those look to me like real And those were spaces. earlier. Yeah, and, er- and those are earlier, and your work's changed since then. But they seem intensely personal, but they also seem very much kind of like a summation of what it's like to be a certain pers- type of person living in America today. Hmm. And so I automatically think of that idea of like how we kind of burrow away in our apartments and kind of try to have private experiences and be entertained. But I started thinking about like solid, the solitary mythos of like Americans out on the frontier by themselves and <laughs> thinking about America becoming increasingly urbanized and then how we kind of are still trying to preserve this idea of privacy, but there are just more and more of us and we can't avoid each other. <laughs> yeah. And so much of it is available online. So yeah. I know what people's houses look like. Who, yeah. Who I've never been. I've never been to their homes. Um, there. Have you ever read? It's called uh, Art is Therapy. It's by uh, Alain de Bouton. Never read it. Okay. He's a, he wrote, I think he wrote, a, he, it's not called Proust for Dummies, but it might. it's something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, He's a contemporary philosopher, and some people think he's, you know, he dumbs it down. But he has some interesting interesting things to say about um, why we live the way we do, why we create yeah. the spaces that we do. We live in spaces uh, that we create because we need the things. The spaces that we live in create the balance that we need. Um, and he, he obviously goes on. Um, but... And this is, I think, where I was when I was doing that earlier work. I was thinking Mm -hmm. a lot about what you need in a space, what the space says about you. But I think as time has gone on, and this wasn't even, this wasn't conscious. Somebody said it to me in a discussion. They said, I don't see that in your work at all, the personal. Really? What I see is paintings about painting. And I thought, wow, I didn't realize that that was coming through. And then I thought about it and I said, yes. Yeah. I am not that concerned about making little doll houses. Right. I am creating spaces. Yeah. They are not about the person. They're a mock-up of a space. There's nothing realistic about them. It's about shape. It's about design. Mm-hmm. It's about color. Mm-hmm. It's about textures, and they're not um, abstracted um, from anything that I know, and they're also, they make sense. They're just informed by much more design than I even thought I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that that was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, well, yeah, it is, it's, can you explain, just can you further explain, like, what does it mean to be making a painting about painting? Yes. Um, well, I didn't know what it was either until <laughs> I had a conversation with this with this guy. Um, but he said, you know, they just seem more formal. They, you're making decisions based on what things look like, not how they might exist in the real world. Mm. And that really kind of that struck a chord in me and I said you're right these aren't this isn't my grandma's house anymore you know or yeah, yeah. anything where well this is what it looked like or this is what I felt like it looked like it's, it, it became this is what I want it to look like this is how it's balanced this is how it needs to be to be aesthetically pleasing to me or how it means something to me mm-hmm. not this is what I imagined you know like you're not trying to capture reality at all you're trying to create something in a way you're a, you're a, you're still engaged in abstraction mm-hmm. on some level yes yeah like not it's not they're recognizable objects but it's sort of a an abstracted reality like it's yeah basically there are no people involved yeah. in these spaces they are com- like they are abstracted from other realities and sort of mm-hmm. become an amalgam or something so many disparate elements of my choosing, but I'm aware that I'm choosing them. It's not, I'm not creating a narrative for right. someone else's narrative. Right. Which is what right, I think right. I had been doing in those earlier. You create, things. there's definitely a narrative in, in like the law and order and the sync one. It's sure. like, I picture somebody waking up and like mm-hmm. that. That kitchen was, is my parents' kitchen. Yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah. You can tell, right? right? And and one of the things that, I mean, I think it was, those stood out to me because you've moved in this direction of no narrative, right? Mm-hmm. 
and those to me and and one of the things that was really interesting to me about your current work like your 2018 works is the the sort of lack of human presence right. in the works they're more sterile there's not yeah. there's not clutter there's it's, no clutter yeah more decisions are being made you know i mm-hmm. um i have a problem i guess it's hard to it's hard to know when you're done it's hard to yeah. know if you want to really push something with detail um, both with paint and with ideas. It's hard to know when to stop. It's hard to know when if something's finished. Mm-hmm. And these have become very easy for me to walk away from and say, I just need this and then I'm done. And then I mm-hmm. am done. It's it's that simple. I'm like, this needs to be settled. And once it's settled, that's it. Um, there are a lot of decisions being made, bef- it seems like, beforehand. Right. You said um, in an earlier interview, like before this phase of painting interiors, that you need a like a day in the studio. Like you can't kind of paint like a couple hours and then go do something else. Like you have to devote like yeah. a day or two in the studio and kind of, but you and, and and kind of just go at your own pace and by your own terms for the day. You also said that you painted like three paintings a day or something at that point. But now that you're working with like furniture and you're sort of trying to create a space, has that pace uh, slowed down or changed at all? Has your has your working process changed? Um, yeah, I have lots more time now because rents a lot cheaper here. Mm-hmm. And I dedicate, except for when it's 95 degrees out, I dedicate... Um, just about every day to going to the studio mm-hmm. if possible. Um, and that, That's great. That means that I go like it's my office. Yeah. Um, I'm there by a certain time. I can stay as long as I want, but I'm never there for less than a few hours. And that's how it's always been for me. Um, if I can't really immerse myself in whatever I'm doing, um, there's no point in me going. Mm-hmm. When I used to have to travel 45 minutes each way, if I couldn't spend at least five hours there once I was there, it wasn't worth it for me to go. Right. Um, so it became a matter of practicality. But then it became a real um, part of my studio practice where if I'm into something, I'm in the flow, you can't get me out of there. So if yeah. I had to go to work afterwards, I'd like, I don't have work. <laughs> you know, I, I have to, I can't, I can't be, you know, I got to stay. I don't have, I quit. <laughs> I quit right. my job. Right. Um, because... Yeah, my paintings now do take a little bit longer. I I work a lot smaller. I use a lot less paint, mm-hmm. um, but I am still prolific. I might mm-hmm. not be making three paintings a day, but I might make two a week. Mm-hmm. Um, That's a lot. Still yeah, still a lot. My ideas uh, come very quickly, um, so I have to write things down and take pictures of you know things I um, want to do. Could you take us through a process like? You like you see something, then what happens? You know what I mean. Like where? Mm-hmm. How do you get? How does an idea come to fruition or fully develop for you? Yikes! How does that work? Like I said before, it usually starts with a piece of furniture. Mm-hmm. Now sometimes it starts with. It's really the does the setup and the design of the room. Is this a living room? Is this a dining room? Mm-hmm. Because depending on what kind of room it is, is where I, where my interests are at the time. Am right. I interested in making something modern, something mid-century? Am I interested in making something with antiques, with huge, textured, patterned curtains and wallpaper? Mm-hmm. It's really about where my juices are flowing at that moment. Um, yeah, and I can't, I can't really predict where those are going to go. Most of the time it's because I'm on Pinterest and I see Mm -hmm. an awesome credenza. So most of your research is online. Like it's not like you're going to antique stores or... Sometimes sometimes sometimes. I see something in the world. Like if I'm at my friend's house and they're like, oh, this is hand-me-down furniture from grandma Mm -hmm. or whatever. I'll say, oh my gosh, I need to take a picture of that. Or if I see a quilt on someone's bed, I say, oh my God, I need to get a picture of that. So those are, I have like a, like a mental or in some, and of course, a digital uh, file mm-hmm. of things that I will eventually use. Right. 
you know, um, right. I have it's like a backstock, almost. yeah, of of ideas. Where if I'm if I say, oh my gosh, I know what I know what this needs, and I scroll through my phone and say, I need that rug from that thing that I saw once, and and if I can't find it, I have to Google what was that? Where did that rug come from? That Danish rug, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's very piecemeal. It really mm-hmm. is. And so you're you're almost like just aggregating images mm-hmm. and repurposing them. Yeah. And you just go to your database of found images from wherever and yeah. kind of piece them together and draw connections between them and yeah. place yeah. them into a space. Is it do you find that it's an intuitive process? Like like you're not thinking like, oh, this means this, so I have to put this here. It's more like, ooh, I like that, and that's got to go here. Yes. Yeah. The latter. Yeah. That's cool. For sure. Um, there's no, there's, it's not, oh, this wouldn't exist at the same time as this, or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's no. very patchwork. I've noticed also that your walls are, you don't draw corners that much. Sometimes. Sometimes you do. Okay. Sometimes I do, if I need there to be some, some depth. But then sometimes I paint the corner and I say, I this like does not need a corner. And then yeah. I take it out. But some of them certainly do. And, I, you know, sometimes I'll, well, that's not, I guess that's not a corner. But um, I like to include the ceiling sometimes. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're. This, this like, pink room that you did that I found on your website. Uh, I First of all, I love the marble table. I think the, like way that you handled that is really fun because it's sort of it's very painterly and abstract yet really captures marble at the same time but I noticed there is actually there's a corner uh, in terms of like the, the, the floor demonstrates that there's a corner and there's a table oriented like it's against a, the other wall mm-hmm. but then the background is just like a flat pink right so you're sort of playing with like flatness and the illusion of three-dimensional space at the same time almost yeah yeah it seems like it's like sometimes I feel like oh that doesn't make sense and other times I think I don't care Mm -hmm. it's not that's not important to me that's not where my (laughs) I look at it now and I see what you're seeing and I don't think I even noticed it before yeah that 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 uh little stool is askew, which would indicate that there was a corner and that's what you see, but there's no line. There's no, there's no uh, delineation. But I think that's part of what is fun about looking at your works is that the, I mean, the perspectives are all a little askew, right? And For sure. I pay very little attention. To yeah. And that. I think looping back to why I started even thinking about like America and like the frontier is because there's also a sort of folk art look to them. Mm-hmm. Like there's a folk art meets like Matisse meets, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> but there, there's definitely kind of a, a folksy quality in it. I think partly maybe because you're painting furniture and stuff and antiques and I don't know. There's it ties Painting us. untrained. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, you you paint very well. well thank I mean, you. it's very it's very interesting and. But it's completely yeah. I mean, I and this is another thing I learned when, from from the year that I was studying art education, that I abandoned when I came back to Connecticut. Um, yeah. Is because I don't have I didn't have a style when I started painting, or mm-hmm. representationally. I painted what I saw. And that's what I learned when you're teaching children. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's what you think, and that's how you draw a lady's face. She's got she's pretty, and she's got lips, and this is where her eyes are, and they're big and they're blue. But are they really where you think they are on her head? Are they really? right? Yeah. So, I actually learned how to paint that marble by necessity because I was doing a project for this company, and I said, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to paint marble. You know, I'm not, I don't do faux anything. I'm not. Yeah. And I had to sit there like, this needs to be marble because it was commercial. Like, this needs to be marble. I said, I don't know. I just sat down and, and figured it out because that's what you have to do. It's like all those things that you need to learn how to do on the fly for computer. Mm-hmm. You, you know, oh, drag that file here and you need to input mm-hmm. this, da, da, da. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, Google it. YouTube yeah. it. Figure, out, yeah. figure it out. It's like with anything. Yeah. So anything that I saw that I wanted to do, you have to figure it out. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to do that. 
Totally. And I think that's one of the most fun things in a way about being an artist. And I mean, I think these days with all the YouTube videos, everybody's learning new things Mm -hmm. on the fly. Yeah. But one of the cool things I thought when I first started really engaging in art was, oh, if you have an idea, you have to learn how to execute that idea. Yeah. And you end up learning things you never thought you'd have to learn. It's true. You have Uh, to learn by doing it. You know, sometimes you do it the first time and you're like, well, that was easy. And then the next time something comes up like that, you're like, well, I'll just make it again. Then it's hard. Mm -hmm. You have to keep doing it. And sometimes even kind of poorly executed is good enough. And that's where you're happy. That's what happens to me sometimes where it's like, well, it halfway looks like I want it to look. And that's that's actually the aesthetic that I'm going to stick with. And it's, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to describe, but I guess that's as close as I can get to why it might look kind of folky, because I'm not looking for a pure representation of something. Right. I'm looking for my, my ideal, which is different from everybody else's. I mean, in a way, that's what folk art is. It's like someone just being like, this is my visual language, yeah. and I'm just painting by myself, and I'm going to just make, make pictures. and yeah. They make sense to me, mm-hmm. and and they make enough sense to, to the viewer that they can piece together what things are. But there's something fun about seeing things slightly off mm-hmm. scale. Yeah, yeah. And, and seeing the kind of going back and forth between flat and three-dimensional. And, right, and some of them are um, self-aware because um, I make, you know, some things are put into context, like, oh, this person likes Morris Lewis and this person likes impressionistic paintings. I'm mm-hmm. putting it up in there. Um, this imaginary person yeah. who's living in the space that you're painting? Yeah. 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 Or maybe it's just me. That, no, but I mean, that's really fascinating, actually. That's, so in a way, you're kind of creating avatars for these spaces, like you are transforming yourself into a person who would live in this particular space and kind of coming up with ideas about what their taste might be like. See, that's going, I think that that's sort of where I was in the mid, midpoint of these. Yeah. And I don't know, I think I do oscillate be, back and forth between creating a room that is uncanny in a way that maybe somebody... It, like enough idiosyncratic information that maybe it was somebody who lived there and then other situations and other paintings where it's completely design oriented. Some of them are just so clean. No one could. Ever right, right, there. right. They're just stark and flat. Like, I don't know what you have there. Um, I so wait, I started this one. Like that, this that nobody lives. There. Yeah. You know, I, that's 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 not totally a that's a rectangle for a cou- for a, you know, a sofa. Well, it almost looks like like a museum or a gallery space, except for the well, except for the chair right. or sofa. It's very um, much like something that would be in a apartment right. or house. It's just it doesn't look comfortable. It doesn't look like somebody would have put that. I don't know. Oh, the chair? The whole setup. just Totally. Very cold. It's cold. Yeah. What do you think that's about for you, the coldness of it? I think, again, that's just a design practice. Sometimes yeah. I just want something to look... Clean. Sleek and clean. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like the opposite of how I am. <laughs> not yeah. that I'm not clean, <laughs> but... Um, Did you make these works since you moved into your studio space? Mm-hmm. Do you think that that's changed yes. the work? Because you were working at home, right, for a while, and so you're seeing all this. Yeah, the stuff, stuff I at did home. at home, I believe, was a lot more, um, you know, autobiographical. Something that felt um, true to life, piece of piece of America, you know, piece of like the laundry, the laundromat, or yeah. Um, and then I guess when I moved to the studio. It was a clean slate. Maybe I wanted to make work that was also removed. I remember Michael Brennan used to say, you know, I was like, I don't want to move my studio. And he's like, every time you move your studio, your work changes. Yeah. You should look at that as an interesting thing, not as a a negative. So every time I move a studio, I think, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with my work. Because when I moved into the studio, it was a, I mean, you know what it's like at a rector square. It's a white box. Yep. And it's just rife with like possibilities in your Yeah. So starting from a white box, I wanted to make paintings that felt a lot more clean. Yeah. And so that's, I think, where I began. 
But then things get messy again, and I'm making... Oh, my studio's a mess. When you move into a new studio, it's like all the baggage is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then you create new baggage eventually. Oh, yeah. You so know? I, so I do something with my studio that I never did. I don't think I've ever done it with any of my studios, and that's... I mean, it's probably a result of that being my main space. Mm-hmm. I mean, I spent a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. And because it's a place that I have to at least pretend to be professional some of the time, mm-hmm. every time I leave that space, I clean it. Wow. You're, that's great. I mean, it's just, it's a practice that I'm, it's like I can't get out without making sure that there's no can, like Diet Coke cans, because oh, um, my... making sure there's no food stuff. So I, mean, I have a refrigerator and I have um, the necessities, but I make sure that there's nothing on the floor. Mm -hmm. everything's put away. This does not include my working space. Right. My paints are still out and all that, but but the peripheral stuff, like so that I can come back in and just get to work and not be like, oh my gosh. Yeah. What did I do? I have to step over things because that's how my studio was at Pratt. It was just, oh, where was I? What was I doing? This place is like, there's glitter on the floor. There's gold leaf everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea how to start, how to pick up from where I started. And that, and that affects the work that you you make, like all all the the work that you make in that environment. It, and sometimes in a good way is affected by your past work. But when you want to leave that work behind mm-hmm. and it's still there or there's evidence of it still there, it's hard yeah. to kind of leave it behind. Right. Yeah. In this particular, uh, it's called Living Room at Sunset. We've been discussing it for a while. What's the relevance of the window front and center? I mean, you already talked a little bit about how you're fascinated with windows. Um, and maybe I'm, this is just a redundant question, but there seems to be, it's, there. what are you looking at? <laughs> I think that the inside-outside thing, which we talked about before, but that outside, there's such an opportunity for strange colors that you might not find inside, mm-hmm. um, gradations of color that don't exist anywhere but nature, um, just creates some, when you look at it in this context, a very strange situation that there's a hole in my house yeah, and I can see outside and that picture, cause it's a picture from inside, uh, creates a very interesting image on my wall. Hang on a second. The thing I'm perceiving as a window, you're saying, is... I mean, it is a window, but what I'm saying is... You're painting a picture, though. It's a frame. Yes, and that whatever window you're looking at, if this wasn't an actual... If this wasn't an actual uh, portal to outside... Yeah. It could just be a rectangle on your wall. Right. So it's just another opportunity for a different image in a room. Gotcha. So you're seeing a window is, I mean, it's a window to the outdoors, but it's also, it's framed in the same way that a painting's framed. It's a thing that we can kind of look through. Right. Like a painting. There's a painting that I did. It's called Pink Couch on the Ocean. Okay. And I don't know if you have it there. I don't have it there. We could go to your website and look at it. Oh, yeah. So when I posted that, Emily, it's a cool one. Hawk and Claw said, that's a really cool painting behind the couch. I said, what? And I said, well, that's amazing that that's what you're seeing. And I said, well, that's that's one way to look at it. Well, so I think what's interesting is like, I mean, and going back to paintings about painting, right? Mm-hmm. That statement that you took from it is like when you're making a painting, even if you're painting a window, you're still making a painting. That's right. In the window. Mm-hmm. And so there's kind of a funny play between like you're actually painting paintings of paintings on the wall. Yeah. And then you've got stuff that looks like a window and that we sort of immediately view as a window, but it's still a painting. Like it's just like it's paint. The other paint. It's paint. It's paint. (laughs) Yeah. It is not. And that's why when that image, when that guy said to me, like, these are paintings about painting, I was like, no. And then I said, yeah. I mean, in a way that I never thought about representational painting, that it's paint on canvas about something else. Right. I found that b- somewhat mind blowing. I didn't think that he put a word to something that I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to express that. It's interesting because you always have seemed like someone who loves paint, like you love the material. Mm-hmm. You love to play with the material, whether or not it's a picture of a room or it's just a weird shape that you're preoccupied with. Mm -hmm. 
like those arches yeah. that you were yeah. drawing in the past. And mm-hmm. you just love playing with the material. And, and I think that that still comes through even with these rooms, right? You're still playing with material. You have stuff that looks abstract. Mm-hmm. And then you have this fascination with pattern mm-hmm. um, and, and painting textile. And I read in a past interview that you also were an amateur quilter. Is that the case or that you did quilt at some point? I, Is did, that... I did quilt at one point. I just was really a really rough quilter. Like I, yeah. I was no good at it, but I loved going to the store. Right. I loved going to the store and picking out patterns. And if I had never done anything with them, I probably would have been just as happy. Yeah. Um, it's just about finding these combinations that's so enticing. And quilting, in a way, is like the original collage, right? Yeah. It's collage before collage. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I mean, same thing about, you know, going to an art store, going to any store. I can go to a knitting store. I don't knit. Yeah. And be like, oh, my God, I want this and this color and this color, and I want these to go together. And I'll take a picture of them together and then put it into a painting. Because, Mm. I, you know, I have no interest in that material. Yeah. But it informs something else. So I'm always looking into stores. I don't even care what they're selling. It's yeah. really just about finding these situations that you don't see or that you haven't yeah. seen before. Yeah. You know, if I see a row of cars that are, stand, you know, parked next to each other, I go, hmm, that's weird. I thought these were all gray, but they're all different gray. So I'll take a picture of it and say, well, I've been just thinking a lot more about color. The other day I went to Home Depot and... I wanted to find a book of, of color swatches. And, you know, we don't have that. Um, but feel free to take as many as you want from the wall. So I went to the nice. wall. Because what I've been thinking about lately is, were those color aid papers? Did you ever use those in school? <sighs> what are color? No, so they're, I, I they're didn't. They're like hand dyed, like hand, like silk screened. And they come in different amounts. I think 280 or I forget. And they're not cheap because they are hand done. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times for when I was working at Hall's Art Supply, they were on a lot of lists for like foundation uh, classes. So I never had them myself because I didn't go to school for that. But they were very uh, like you could get lost looking at all these colors. So, um, yeah. So I never had one of those, but I was looking for something like it, something a little because they're all individual papers. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for something that I could sort of uh, just have on hand to look in paintings to say, you know, I want that to be blue, but I don't know what color blue. And so that you can go into it without putting any paint on the canvas, um, you know, to know exactly what shade of blue before you before you even mix it. Got it. So you you'd use the that paper as a model and mix the paint to that particular. color. Exactly. That's cool. Yeah. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So I went to the store and, and was able to take as many as I wanted. And I created my own book because they don't sell them. And that has made such a huge difference for me because when you're working, a lot of times I, I upload a picture, a painting that I'm working on to the computer. And then I tweak the colors there to see if this would be better as a purple. This would be better as red. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's all aesthetics. Yeah. You know, that's all just design. Mm-hmm. And, you know, should I move this over here? And it's just so interesting that. That has become a really big part of my, of making a painting for me, photoshopping it either in my head, or photoshopping it like in an analog way of like holding up a color, blocking it out, right? You know, right? But I can easily just like you know take it away. I was wrong, you know. No, that's not going to work. That's cool. Yeah, that's a cool save process. A of, save a lot of paint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, this one for sure was something that what color wall should that be? You know, the laundromat or no, the, uh, this one right here. Oh, the one in the back, the big green yeah. painting. The, yeah. The credenza. Yeah. Well, you can't see it from here, but um, I'll put that on the website. Too. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, it's a balancing thing. C- can this can this room support this color? We'll see. <laughs> it's a puzzle. Each one of them is just a puzzle. This credenza one, it's so funny because the chair mm-hmm. is three-dimensional, but the legs are all hitting the, uh-huh. the like, edge between the wall and the floor. Yeah. Everything's against the wall and almost <laughs> looks like it was painted into the wall. Right, right. You know? Because the legs have some green on them. and Yeah. You can just see what I care about and what I don't care about. And it's not that I don't care about. I was, that was wrong to say. I do care, but it, this information is less inform- less 
important for me. The 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 legs being the, prominent is less interest less important for me than say this sharp line. That's sh- the you know the horizon yes, line. Yes, right. Or, so the horizon line becomes really important. Yeah. Yeah, like that can't vary really. Lastly, like let's just talk about some of the artists that you're looking at now. I mean, you you talked a lot about how you spent you've spent a lot of time in New York. You spent a lot of time going to shows. You spent a lot of time around other artists, and this has become your time to develop your own voice. While you're in New Haven, do you feel like there are artists that are influencing you from the past or present? Are there people you're looking at? Uh, you mean just anywhere? Anywhere, yeah. Any artists that like you're thinking about? Uh, contemporary. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be contemporary. It could be people from the past. Like, I mean, I see, I don't know, Matisse a lot. Yeah. Um, in the, the patterned sure. things. Yeah. Um, which is awesome. I love Matisse. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love Matisse also. I look at, I mean, I look up at the Impressionists, especially since I've been spending more time outside and wanting to um, put that down. So mm-hmm. some of my newer work has outsor- outdoor scenes. Um, at Through edge. windows or? Mm-hmm. Let, me, let me show you here. Um, for example, this. Ooh, that's awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, what's that called? This one is called View from Balcony. Something like that, where you can see the outside. And um, I really like this, this sort of pointillist outdoor <laughs> scene. Because then you're actually, you're really making paintings about painting. You know, you're referencing. I mean, you're already, you're, you have paintings literally of Morris Lewis, but it's cool. You have these windows that become paintings exactly. and are referencing painting uh, from the past. And then you have that sofa that looks like a Matisse <laughs> painting, kind of. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's clear I have a stack of Impressionist painters in my, it shouldn't be a surprise, my studio is just full of Monet and that's cool. Bonard and Vuillard. They're my favorites, and that's who I look at primarily, but I also am interested in contemporary design. So mm-hmm. I think that's where the whole, the whole aesthetic comes from. I think one of the things I like about this um, black floral, floral couch with ceiling fan is you've both got, you've got the outdoor pointillist scene and then you're sort of referencing nature with the flowers mm-hmm. on the sofa so there's a kind of uh it's not just the painting being framed as something separate it's kind of coming into the home mm-hmm. in a clever way are there any other well, thing let me you, when you're asking about artists that i like yeah artists um, that you like but i look at a ton of hopper he just has a oh a yeah i see that that just blows me away yeah there's a silence I mean, I'm talking about the paintings that don't have people in them because people to me are distracting. Uh-huh. I don't, I mean, I love the paintings, but I love the homes. Um, this Yale, you go to Yale University mm-hmm. Art Gallery, they have a bunch of hoppers there, right? I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love um, someone, I, I, the gauziness of Florine Stedheimer. I love looking mm. at her work. Her stuff is so detailed, though, in a way, and it's so specific to, I mean, she, she has like, there's a theme going on in all of her paintings. They're almost like political. And, yeah. Um, but her style is like nobody else's. But I think I take something from everybody. Sure, yeah. I mean, you. how can you not, right? You're, you're a sponge. Artists yeah. are sponges. Yeah. Like I'm, obviously my work doesn't have much in common with um, Frankenthaler, but I look at her work and has to. it has to get in there somewhere. Right, because, yeah. Because, I mean, she'll inform something someday. Total. So what do you love about Frankenthaler? Um, saturation. Mm. Um, the, I mean, just the, like, it's so gentle, but it also feels, you can feel like the, the dyed nature of the fiber. Mm. Um, I don't know. There's something just very delicious about the, yeah. the colors yeah. that she uses. I think we should wrap it up, mm-hmm. um, but I want to ask, do you have any upcoming shows that you want to plug or? Um, so I have one I'm excited about is um, there's a gallery in um, Greenwich and mm-hmm. it's attached to the library. I've never been there, but it's the Flynn Gallery. And in September, they're having their inaugural show and it's going to be a big group show. I haven't seen the space yet. But it's my understanding that it's really, really big. And it's cool. brand new. And I forget who the architect was. I think it's Pelly. 
Oh, cool. And they want a lot of my work for that show. So that's awesome. Well, yeah, because it's, yeah. it's a brightly, be- you know, brand new space um, in September. So congratulations. Thank you. And I have a couple of group shows coming up in Brooklyn, uh, one at uh, Underdonk. And cool. Um, there's a gallery, Tulu Fine Art in Brooklyn, and it's Carrie Oldham and Michelle Tulu. And that's T I L L O U. And I guess they moved to Brooklyn and they're having um, a group show as well. So that'll be coming in October. Awesome. So you got a lot of stuff coming up. That's great. Yeah. it's It keeps me busy. It's nice. And that's the other thing about being in the studio. I enjoy being in my studio. I, I don't think I, if, even if I got to be very like somebody who's very busy and very important, I still love doing the little things. Packaging my artwork is one of my favorite things. Is it? That's great. It's, it's like... It's it's a it's a busy task that just. But it's one of those moments where you kind of decide my artwork's important. Like it needs to be or packaged it's or done or it's gone. It's, it's out of here. Done. Yeah. I don't. You know, I'm not going to have to look at this for a while. It's going out in the world, and I don't. Have, you know, it makes room for new stuff. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming on to the first stop. Thank you very much. This was a really nice interview. Thanks for yeah. It was me. it was a great conversation. Special thanks to Bruce Barber, director of WNHU, for providing the resources and guidance to make this podcast possible. 